last week. So, so we're happy to have Sergey Dubovsky. He's uh, a professor at uh, NYU. He has uh, worked on uh, many, many subjects in uh, theoretical physics, uh, ranging from uh, modifications of gravity to uh, restrictions on fundamental restrictions on what can happen in quantum field theory, effective theories of fluid dynamics, cosmology, phenomenology, and most recently he's been doing a lot of uh, very interesting work on various aspects of two-dimensional physics. Uh, today he's going to tie a lot of that together and talk about the higher problem. Uh, okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, I should say it was a bit of a challenge to prepare this talk because it's a third talk in two months for kind of the same audience. And I realize it may be not that much of a problem for you because there is an initial uh, protection reaction that people tend to forget about what they hear on the talks. But I remember what I talked about. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to tell the same thing, so I tried to do uh, something different. Uh, and actually, uh, well, this is the slide I was showing last time, and that was the slide I was showing uh, uh, many times uh, last year. A little bit more. So there are three parts to the story. One has to do with dynamic specificity flux group, another integrable quantum gravity. And really, this was my seminar uh, last time I visited. This was my colloquium last time I visited. And then there is, well, <coughs> I, an idea uh, for solving the refractive hierarchy problem or thinking about the refractive hierarchy problem. And usually, I'm kind of, well, I have, due to time limitations, I have to pick one of these topics. So here, given that I, this is my third talk, I can really cover all of them. Uh, so I'll uh, focus on this last subject here, but really I make it some, somewhat more broad. I won't talk just about uh, the, this recent idea we, we had, but uh, just it will be uh, some semi-informal discussion of electronic hierarchy problem. And the choice of, for the topic, well, I think it's obvious because uh, well, I think that was the major question driving development of particle physics for the last 40 years. It goes from experimental point of view, but also as far as quantum field theory goes for theorists. Uh, and I think for, for several generations of particle physicists, well, it was one of the questions. So kind of in daytime, you may be thinking about stuff like this, and that's what I'm doing mostly. Like, but uh, that's really something we keep thinking in the night time. Uh, and uh, so well, given that I gave so many talks here, now I, I, I can talk about this stuff. Uh, and just for your orientation, let me put some sanity axis here. <laughs> so I was working all this stuff, and I think it's all interesting. Otherwise, I wouldn't be investing my, my time into that. Uh, but well, this last subject, well, there is some uncertainty here. And I'm not <laughs> totally <laughs> sure whether it uh, below this threshold or above this threshold. Uh, but it's not going to be boring. Uh, well, when it goes a little bit down there, then it starts getting boring. <laughs> 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 I hope to prevent it from going too far down. Uh, OK, so uh, I think hierarchy problem, well, this kind of the questions about which everybody has strong opinion, and any two people have different opinions. So I think uh, for uh, discussing this issue, it's good to define what I understand by hierarchy problem. And in the course of this talk, I will give several definitions with different level of refinements. But let me start just with, I think well, that's accurate and correct uh, way of presenting things. So that's kind of first iteration. So we saw 125 GB Higgs. This is a, uh, as far as we can tell so far, this is elementary uh, scalar field. Uh, and in situations like that, uh, well, there are quadratic divergences, which really indicate that uh, if, if you introduce new physics in your theory with a scale, mass scale, characterized by uh, this lambda, which is lambda new physics, scale of new physics, uh, then uh, there are corrections uh, to the mass of these particles, which go as uh, the mass square of, of, of uh, this uh, energy scales time, times maybe some uh, loop factor. Uh, and, well, we know gravity attests the presence of a new mass scale, uh, at least at 10 to 19 GB. 
Uh, and so the problem is that why we see this light scalar particle, why its mass, uh, if we plug here and plug them, uh, it would be a huge correction, so what, what cancels this correction? So uh, this uh, first, uh, first iteration, will, which is good for uh, most of my talk, so that, and I think it's kind of, it's, it's accurate way uh, of thinking what the problem is, and of course, my, much of our intuition about the problem comes from condensed matter systems, so where well we know that it's an actual physics physical problem. So we know to uh, in condensed matter language it tells us that it's hard to put the system close to second order phase transition. You really you need to know, tune the macroscopic knobs which you have in your system, uh, and so the question is how comes uh, in materialization of this system standard model which we found in nature and how this tuning was done, was accomplished. Well, and of course, uh, there is also a cosmological constant problem, which is a uh, close uh, cousin of this one. Uh, and well, I, mostly, mo most of my discussion will be phrased in terms of the hierarchy problem, although most of what they say will apply to cosmological constant uh, as well. Uh, well, now uh, there are kind of good ideas to address this problem. And really good for me here means conservative. So that's something which we already saw to happen before in nature. And uh, there are uh, two ideas. One is that, well, there is no problem. Since there is, this quadratic divergences are there because there is the scale of new physics TV and uh, new particles will come in. And uh, so Higgs either not elementary or there is a symmetry which enters the quantum TV which cancels uh, these, these divergences. Uh, so that's one option. But, and another option uh, is that well, I think it, uh, it's physical fact that the value of the Higgs mass is crucial for our life. And since if you change it by order of magnitude, we lose atoms. So that's not something to speculate about. That's just, just a fact. And that fact opens the possibility that maybe the Higgs mass is not a fundamental parameter. Maybe it is what it is just for this reason. So there are other regions of the universe where you take different values and, uh, well, th th that's it. Uh, but I should say, uh, well, I was showing this slide. The, uh, uh, it's very amusing that this is now observable. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to address this. So I was showing this fly slide at CERN. And after the talk, people came to me, oh, that was a very nice joke to put in the conservative <laughs> approaches. But I really mean that. So it is conservative. Well, and actually, the more part of my talk would be to describe to discuss whether there is an alternative to that. But because I wanted to start with more broad discussion of hierarchy problems, so I'll spend some time discussing these options. So I really mean that, that it's conservative in the sense which I said. So we know we, we saw both of uh, things like that happen before. In particular, as far as this point goes, because it's somewhat controversial. Well, I think well, this is the best known example. So for maybe hundreds of years, people thought that we should, the goal of physics or metaphysics, whatever it's called, used to call, uh, uh, there would be to calculate the size of planetary orbits. And uh, that, that's fundamental constants in nature. Well, of course, it was realized that's not the case. There are many stellar systems. Uh, and uh, the moment you realize that, all what you learn that you were asking the wrong question. And uh, well, it's, I think one of the important skills of being a good physicist is to ask the right question. So it may happen that asking what is the mass of the uh, Higgs is the wrong question. And the situation is similar to that. So, and that's, that's why I call this uh, uh, solution conservative. It may be somewhat disappointing, but it, it, is, it is conservative, I believe. Uh, now, uh, I think the standard, kind of standard popular view of the situation which we're facing now, I think, well described by this slide, so that's not my drawing, that's drawing of Italian artist, Giovanni so, Villadora. So, so you, I think you used um, anthropic in a, in a provocative way. It's just accidental. I mean, you could just as well say unexplainable, right? Well, it's not, it is anthropic in a sense. Uh, we, yeah, so that's what, what I said. So we need Higgs mass to be roughly within order of magnitude what it is because otherwise we lose atoms. Or we need cosmological constant to be what it is. If it's much larger, we lose galaxies. So there is some really obvious threshold associated with this quantity, which completely destroys, uh, destroys condition for life. 
And that opens for possibility for constants like this to be, well, just cho chosen by that criteria. Which really, for I think for physicists point of view, that means they are not interested in physical observables. So there is other, other incidental requirement, the existence of observers, which uh, came in here, which made this uh, constant uh, not interested. One should focus on something else, just like in this example, the moment you realize this, you focus on dynamics of how planets move around the sun, and not asking the question why the orbits there are there, whatever there are. I don't think there is much more to learn from here. And uh, so, yeah, I think the popular view of this situation was you know, summarized by this slide, which was shown at many conferences. That really we chosen we choosing here between naturalness and multiverse, and kind of the fact that we don't see at the LHC uh, new natural physics so far points in the direction of the multiverse. Uh, well, actually, I, I disagree with this view, uh, and I would argue that actually the moment we talk about naturalness, we're already in the landscape. So for this condensed ma metaphysics analogy, I think is very useful for that. So there we really know that there is a tuning because we can tune parameters. They're really different system, and we can uh, tune knobs on the system, and that's how we know uh, that uh, uh, that uh, well, you need to do tuning to be close to second order phase transition. Uh, so whenever we discuss naturalness, we already do do this tuning in our head. So. Uh, and, Unless there is really physical realization of the landscape, by, by landscape I mean just a theory with many different vacua, and this vacua exists in the universe. Uh, so I don't think there is any hope to turn this question in the robust physics question. Uh, so on the other hand, well, theoretically we have reasons to think that landscape is there. This string theory predicts it for us. And I think it's great because that turns this question in, in principle, if we understand theory well enough, it turns this question in a really well posed dynamical question. So if you understand how many vacuum are there of different kind, if you understand how they are populated by dynamics, you have a chance of predicting, which is it's, it's very hard, but at least there is a chance uh, of predicting what you expect, or where you expect to find observers. So there is at least a chance that it will becomes not a question of aesthetics, and I think we'll never agree on aesthetics, but it really turns into a well posed uh, uh, physics question. And, the rest of my discussion will be kind of uh, in this framework. So I already assume I assume that something like landscape exists. Otherwise, I don't think we, there is any uh, solid ground for discussing hierarchy problem at all. Uh, so then, really, if you take this point of view, really the question is: So how do we test that this assumption is correct? How do we test that the landscape is there? Yeah, where physicists we want just to test things to. Uh, check, uh, check them by observations. Uh, and, well, first of all, let me uh, tell you that, well, actually, landscape, in some sense, we know that landscape is there. So, landscape is not a novel product of string theory, it's really a generic feature of gravitational theory. So, to convince you that, uh, let's, let's do the following exercise. So, so, let's imagine, let's just look standard model with gravity, uh, and let's look for other vacua in the standard model. So let's try to do with standard models the same exercise which we do in string theory. There we start with 10 dimensions and start compactifying some of them. So let's let's do the same in standard model. Uh, and it, it turns out, well, you find quite a bit of vacuum in standard model if you do this exercise. So actually there is one family of vacuum which I didn't even mention here. Where ADS2 process 2 vacuum. Uh, so if you take a black hole and you take a charge, the like put charge of black hole and then black hole becomes close to extremal, then the geometry of uh, extremal black hole is that, well, you have, asymptotically you have flat space, of course, but as we approach, there is a uh, kind of this funnel which develops, which has geometry ADS2 process 2. That's, for instance, how uh, famous ADS5 process 5 geometry emerges in string theory. It's a near horizon geometry of a uh, bunch of uh, high dimensional black holes, deep rates. So you can imagine doing the same in standard model, and so you find this ADS2 process 2 vacua, which are labeled by electric field uh, of black hole. So this is one family of vacua, which are the same nature as the vacua we talk about uh, in string theory. Uh, but, well, they're a little bit funny in the sense that they're, they're not really low dimensional series because the radius of curvature of ADS is the same as the size of the sphere there. 
So that's why uh, I point out, like, there's this other example. Uh, so let's imagine the following. Let's again start, take standard model and let's compactify one of the dimensions, special dimensions, and look for one here like that. Uh, so what's shown here, this, this is a potential for the, so it's three-dimensional theory now, uh, with compact special dimensions. So what's shown here is a potential for the field which is the size of this dimension, size, size of this circle. Uh, and it turns out that the exact shape of this potential is uh, rather sensitive to neutrino masses. So it's all determined by the known physics which we have a standard model. So uh, this potential at large distances is dominated by cosmological <laughs> constant. Then there is a Casimir energy which makes it negative coming from bosons, from photon and graviton. And then at short distances, Casimir energy from fermions kicks in and it creates potential which grows at short dis distances. And now depending on the mass of the two lightest fermions, this potential may or may not have a minimum. And it turns out for a standard model, uh, if you take a radio <coughs> from uh, solar and three constellations, actually, well, it's, there is a minimum here. There is ADS vacuum in standard model, which is, well, it's actually, actually, it's not that bad vacuum. You may imagine some uh, uh, life in this vacuum. Uh, so it's ADS curvature length is for the Hubble now. It's huge three-dimensional universe. And the compact dimension is there is over the 20 micron in, in, in size. So one may already ask questions, okay, why don't we live there? It's a good place to live. Uh, and, but this is just an example. I think it, actually that, that example it's illustrates nicely how this vacuum arises. So the moment you take the rotational theory and start looking for uh, uh, configurations with some of the dimensions being compact, you, you get, uh, uh, it's easy to get uh, lots of vacuum. And another interesting property of this vacuum, which will be important later, that there is a, uh, from this three-dimensional point of view, there is a very light scalar particle in this vacuum, which is just the component of electromagnetic field uh, along the compact dimension. So it's a three component, uh, and naively it would be massless because there is a gauge symmetry, uh, but then due to a Haroga bomb effect, the virtual electrons going around the loop uh, create uh, potential for, for, uh, for, for, for this component. But because the loop is of order the size, like the micron size, which said by neutrino masses, there is, there is locality suppression uh, to this effect. So the mass for this uh, particle is suppressed by a factor like e to minus 10 to the 8. So it's a very, very light particle in, in, in this universe. Uh, so this is to illustrate that actually we know landscape is there. It is there already in the physics which we know. It's, it's the standard model. So to formulate uh, the question more robustly, so probably well, first of all, well, we saw few vacuum, but where numbers like 10 to 500 comes from, come from, uh, and uh, so that's really, and that's what kind of we call multiverse. Really, it's a huge multi, uh, uh, plenty to do vacuum. Uh, well, and really, again, that's you don't need to know that much about string theory to understand where uh, where this is coming from. So we need to know this theory with extra dimensions, and there are few of them, uh, six. Let's say six. Uh, then you need to compactify some of them. You, and this compactification will have no trivial topology. And what you re I really mean by a trivial topology is that there are no contractible cycles in this geometry. Uh, and well, one reason you expect that to be the case because well, string theory is famously a simple theory with, a, uh, with, a sim with no parameter. But you need to create a standard mo produce standard model from there, which is quite a bit of a mess. So the, the, the way this mass, mass emerges is determined by topological properties of this compactification manifold. So, uh, and the last fact which you need to know that theory has gauge fields. Uh, and then uh, uh, the way uh, this n numbers 10 to 500 emerge is the following. So, so you have these internal cycles, which are analog of the sphere in my ADS2 two process 2 example. And you can turn on electric field piercing these cycles. Just like you can turn on charges of black hole in this ADS2 process 2 example. When I was talking about uh, this standard model ADS2 process 2 vacuum, uh, there was a parameter which, black hole, which is black hole charge which parameterizes them. So you can turn to large electric field because the back reaction will be large, so it will destroy the geometry. But let's say you have uh, for the tens of the hundreds of the cycles, which is not oh, 100, which is 
not that unusually large number, yeah, because of the geometry here, it's, uh, usually people talk about Calabi-Yau manifolds, which are supersymmetric complexification, so it's quite common that they have a whole few, few hundred contractible cycles. And again, you need some complexity to, uh, to get standard model. Uh, so if you have hundreds of these cycles, and let's say through each of them you can turn, turn on a uh, uh, few tens of units of flux without destabilizing your geometry, well, that's, that's how you get 10 to 500 numbers. So these are just different uh, flux compactification. So again, the physics is very simple, and that all, that's what, all what you need uh, to get these huge numbers. It's simple combinatorics. Uh, so this is all to convince that really, but well, I, I told you, we know landscape is there because this is there in standard model. So really, what we should think about, so how do we test its richness and dynamical relevance? So how do we test that really uh, there are these 10 to 500 not vacuum in, in a uh, theory which described uh, uh, nature, uh, not, which is just on the paper, uh, and whether these vacuum are relevant uh, for, um, uh, for the physics which we observe. And unfortunately, that's very hard. So there are very few ideas how to do it directly. Uh, one of the ideas is uh, you see something like traces of bubble nucleation from this other vacuum in CMB, that would be a uh, very uh, di direct uh, uh, example of a direct test, uh, but it's tough. Uh, but another approach one may take is, well, let's just take these ingredients and try to see where they lead us. So when do, do they lead to any other observable cons consequences? Is there uh, something uh, which you can, if you really take this point of view seriously, whether, whether you can come, come up with predictions which you I wouldn't expect otherwise. And really, I should say that the choice here is with Occam's razor and uh, with this guy who said this, well, this is very nice quote. So basically, it's a choice from between simplicity, so usually that's a common attitude in doing physics, you choose as few parameters as possible. Uh, but that may be not the right attitude in a situation like that. If the theory is really like you have 10 to 500 vacuum, and you chose one where you live due to large extent random, uh, imposing the right random criterion that there is an observer living here, then in a situation like that, you don't expect to find something simple and nice. You expect to uh, find lots of junk, extra junk there. Uh, so uh, motivated by that, so I, I'll just give you an example of model building, uh, which is motivated by this kind of philosophy. Uh, so we called it. Uh, Axiverse, so this is model building, which complete, it, it's very different uh, uh, attitude to, towards model building and to, towards uh, what is uh, kind of what is nice and what is uh, plausible than in conventional model building, because usually well, you have a problem to introduce one parameter to solve it, one new particle to solve it. Uh, so here, as you'll see, the logic will be uh, completely different. So before I told you that. Uh, these three ingredients, that what gives rise to a uh, multitude of vacua. But actually, the same three ingredients gives you gives rise to expectation of what we call axivers. Uh, and well, this is just it's a plenitude of light axions, plenitude of uh, light uh, uh, pseudo Goldstone particles, which you see in any particular vacuum. Uh, and well, first of all, they're generic on the landscape. And the way they arise, I already illustrated for you uh, by this very, very light particle in the, uh, in the uh, standard model, ideas 3 versus 1 vacuum. So whenever you have gauge fields, and whenever, whenever you have uh, in some compactification manifold with non counteractable cycle, uh, then there will be gauge field configurations, which are analog of this Wilson loop for, uh, for a Heronov bomb flux for, uh, for photon. So the high dimensional analogs of that, which remain massless at the level of perturbation theory because they come from gauge fields, but uh, get mass from the effects, like the non-perturbative effects, like this loop of virtual electron going around uh, the circle uh, for the standard model. Uh, and as I said, we expect to have hundreds of cycles with the compactification manifold describing our universe. So that gives rise to expectation of hundreds of these particles. Uh, and QCD provides a strong hint, at least for one axion, so I think well, uh, QCD axion is by far the best solution of strong CP problems, so with this so far, unfortunately, we have only indirect indication, we can become a direct indication if we 
find these axioms. So we have a hint that at least one exists. And what is very important, unlike Higgs mass or cosmological constant problems, there is no reason for QCD axiom to be there from entropic consideration. So that's a very nice example of a problem uh, which is not contaminated by this anthropic thinking because theta uh, angle, well, it's less than 10 to minus 10. Observationally, if it were even order one, they wouldn't change physics dramatically. Well, if it were point one, it would be totally irrelevant. It would be order one. Strong interactions would be somewhat different, uh, but, but still, there is nothing as dramatic as losing atoms or losing, losing galaxies. So this is an example of fine-tuning problem which really has to be solved dynamically. Uh, and now, combining these two facts together, now one expects in this mode of thinking, thinking of this, in the plenitude uh, mode of thinking, one actually expects there should be more of these axioms because it would be very strange. If something which comes out easily, there is no reason for them to be there. Uh, uh, apart from the dynamics prefers them, and we have indications that there is one, one is there. In situation like that, we may expect that there should be many more. So this is an illustration of very different model building rules. Usually, you're, if you solve this, the problem with introducing one particle, you are happy. Here, uh, you look at the, this problem as indication that this particle may exist, and from there, you conclude, oh, probably there are many more of the particles of this kind. Uh, and furthermore, as you already saw, uh, the axial masses are exponentially sensitive to your compactification, so that's this uh, uh, e to minus 10 to the 8 factor there. Uh, so, uh, well, that gave, rise, that gave rise to interesting observational signatures. It spans essentially over 23 orders of magnitude in length, so I don't have time to go into there, but there are effects, for you can see in CMB, in uh, meta power spectrum, probably the coolest effect that uh, this. Uh, ultralight axioms, when the Compton wavelengths is of order the size of astrophysical black hole, it destabilizes spinning black holes. It's something I talked about here actually three years ago, but there's no chance anyone remembers about that. Uh, but the bottom line here is that there is a chance actually that advanced LIGO may be a discovery machine for QCD axiom from observing uh, gravitational waves uh, from, 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 from this phenomenon. Uh, okay, so. So that's what I wanted to say for these good conservative, meaning conservative ideas. And really, if, if you notice, what, what I was discussing, it, it applies in both cases. So really, I was discussing consequences of landscape rather than whether it's kind of anthropic or natural uh, electronic uh, uh, TV, TV scale physics per se. Uh, and yeah, I think really this emphasis of, on uh, uh, conflict between natural and versus anthropics is somewhat misplaced. I think really the question is whether there is this landscape or not. And just the very presence of landscape doesn't give a preference for, to any of these solutions. Uh, but what I want to discuss in the rest of my talk, I want uh, to discuss, what, well, I think it's not a very good idea, actually, do, uh, and it's, I think it wasn't really our idea, so people say it in different ways before. And, uh, and really, idea says, we, we call it natural theory. Uh, so really, it says, well, OK, just there is something wrong in our standard way of thinking about hierarchy problems. How nature doesn't calculate in, in the Wilsonian way. Well, of course, the ob obvious problem of saying that, that's very nice, but OK, but which way it calculates? So uh, you want to make it a little bit more, more concrete. Uh, and. Uh, why I call it bad? Because, because, because it's radical. It's something which we didn't see to happen in nature before. If something like that would be realized, it will be really something uh, uh, very different. And Well, I think it's a healthy attitude in physics to first look at the conservative options and then at the radical ones. So that's why I, I, I call it bad. Uh, and, but the way uh, we run into thinking about this is that, well, actually, we're not thinking about hierarchy problem. We're just playing with two-dimensional quantum field series. And we'll run into construction, which I will uh, describe for you. And then we'll get confused. And, uh, and I think, well, this construction, in, in some sense, provides proof of concept for this idea. So let me describe the construction for you. Uh, so 
the whole construction it will be uh, in two in two dimensions. So two dimensional theories, I should say right away, two dimensional theories are special in many respects, and I will be using special properties of two dimensional theories in this construction. Uh, but they are not special as far as hierarchy problems goes. So for sure there is a hierarchy problem in two dimensions, and again we're speaking about condensed matter systems. For sure, much of our experience about condensed matter comes from uh, two-dimensional systems. So, Ising model is an example. So, and we know we need to tune parameters there. So, there is nothing for, for the purpose of my discussion. Uh, there is nothing wrong in, in placing it in two-dimensional context. Uh, and the construction will run the following. So, I'll start with uh, arbitrary uh, quantum field theory in two dimensions which should be natural, by, by which, which I mean the following. If there are scalar particles in this area, uh, then they should be the heaviest particles. So that's what we call natural. So the heaviest, uh, heaviest, so heaviest scale is set by unprotected particles. So I start with a theory like that. So in a theory like this, you can calculate its observables, which are S-matrix, so scattering amplitudes. And then there will be a construction which we call gravitational dressing, which starting from this S matrix gives new S matrix, new set of amplitudes, uh, which uh, called S hat here, which depends on a new parameter L, which is parameter of dimension length. Uh, so and you're supposed to think about it as an analog of Planck, Planck scale. And uh, again, the conventional wisdom about what I told you in the beginning uh, about hierarchy problem, it says, well, when you do something like that, you expect the, uh, these uh, this, uh, new unprotected particles to, to become, their masses to become of order 1 over L. Uh, and, well, I don't want to go into details, but just I want to show that there is a very simple formula, very explicit and simple formula which realizes this construction. So what's uh, written here, so what's wrong here, this is a two dimensional plane, so there are different particles. These are kind of, uh, but massless particles propagating through the speed of light. These are, oh sorry, these are, these are masses. These are, these are massless. So this is a scattering event. Uh, so what's important, and I'm using uh, two-dimensional uh, physics here a big way. So for particles in two dimensions, there is a natural ordering of the set of their momenta, uh, which is essentially, well, it's, which is given by rapidities, or essentially by the order how they enter the causal diamond of Minkowski spacetime. And well, this is the formula. So you take initial S matrix and you multiply uh, this uh, matrix elements by uh, phase factors like that. Uh, so here, this, this star product is a product with epsilon symbol. So this is pi alpha pj beta epsilon alpha beta. So again, that's clearly this formula is very two dimensional. Uh, and uh, well, actually, I showed this slide in the my colloquium uh, last time, uh, and it's. Very simple modification, but I'll, I'll say, uh, remind you a little bit. So it is, this theory has very new theory has very different physical properties. Uh, uh, but so let me summarize some of these properties. So first of all, you should believe me, but well, okay, it's something one can check. This newest matrix it's a well-to-do S matrix in the sense it satisfies all what you want, all this uh, elasticity, unitarity, all, all, all the properties which you require from. Uh, well, to this matrix, this one does satisfy. First of all, physical spectrum remains the same. So I didn't change the masses of asymptotic states. I only changed the amplitude. Now, at lower energies, meaning at energies, much scales, <coughs> distance scales much longer than this parameter L, which was uh, in my construction, there is effective field theory description, uh, which can be summarized in the following way. Just the old theory, the quantum field theory with which I started, plus a bunch of irrelevant operators suppressed by this UV scale which I introduced. So it's pretty much like standard model plus uh, interaction suppressed by Planck scale. So it's pretty much like how standard model uh, looks like at low energies in, in, in the presence of gravity. So for instance, just as an example, if I had a free massive scalar, so I started with this theory, then at lower thought I would generate interactions <coughs> like that. Uh, and so, somehow, I, my thinking about hierarchy from before and the way I formulated for, the, for you before 
well, it somehow suggests that this construction shouldn't be possible. So if uh, if hierarchy problem is a real problem, it shouldn't be possible to write a simple formula and introduce a new mass scale within a series with uh, with unprotected scalars, such that scalars remain light. Because well, if I manage to do that, so also maybe nature may do that. So by definition, in some sense, in some very direct definition of uh, absence of fine tuning, this theory is not tuned. The, the very fact that I managed to write this formula without having to calculate 20 loops and check that uh, corrections to the masses get suppressed at 10 to minus 20 or, or, or the precision, it shows that this theory is not tuned, even though according to standard definition that would be tuned. So if I take a theory like that, that's, that's, such, that's identical to, what, to why we say that standard model is tuned. We have unprotected scalar and we have high dimensional interactions su su suppressed by uh, by, by uh, the high mass scale. So, by the way, run into this construction, and I told, they told you we ran for, for completely independent reasons. So, we were confused by this. So, the, the rest would be uh, to try to make sense of this confusion and to come up with a story why it worked here, how this example is different uh, from the examples where we know uh, uh, fine tuning is there. Uh, and I don't, you. I don't know, I should say that the story was made up a posteriori, so, uh, so maybe, maybe not the right one, but at least that's the best we, we managed to do. So first of all, well, one may ask the question right away, so is it really cheating? So we never see fine tuning in this matrix level, so somehow we can always, when we construct the theory, we can always put set masses of the particles to be whatever they are by the renormalization procedure, and renormalization prescription, and, well, that's it. So in this language, you never see a fine tuning. So that would be boring resolution of this construction, uh, of this, uh, of why this was possible. Uh, well, however, I feel still this construction is interesting in, in uh, several respects. So first of all, even if that's really the answer, uh, well, normally one has to go to build a theory, one has to go through Lagrangian. Uh, and that's when fine tuning enters. Uh, However, here we totally escaped this path. So we did the whole construction direct, directly at the level of functional quantities, but even stronger. So we're not aware of the Lagrangian way of defining the theory at all energies. Uh, and it appears very unlikely that it doesn't exist, as I'll try to argue. So this series, the UV behavior is very different from UV behavior on conventional quantum field theory. So it's not a coincidence that we didn't go through Lagrangian path to construct this theory. And maybe, well, one way to say it is that it exhibits new asymptotic behavior at large energies. So that's something my colloquium was about here uh, in December. Uh, but really, the fast way to summarize it, this, we introduced a new mass scale in this theory, but this, this mass scale doesn't correspond to mass thresholds. So there are no new massive particles there. Uh, and so in that sense, they, uh, well, it's, it's let, let me try to uh, say it in more detail for you, but and it's, the scale is very similar, that's why I brought up this uh, uh, in the very beginning, so the scale is similar to gravity in the, in the following sense. So in, in quantum field theory, when you have a mass scale, when you go at, almost by definition, when you go at energies much higher than um, this mass scale, the, the memory of about this mass scale is lost. So theory becomes approximately scale invariant. So we almost often go say it almost as a, uh, uh, as a definition. It's, it sounds almost as a pathology. So when energy is much larger than some mass, that means you can neglect this mass. Uh, and all quantum field theories are like that. So in more more fancy way to say that, that all quantum field theories described by conformal field theories uh, in, in the UV. So this is an example of a theory which doesn't do that. And I will uh, tell you a little bit more about it later. But uh, so. And, and gravity is also like that. So in, in gravity, we know that's not the case because when you take two particles and collide them at energy much larger than M Planck, we know what happens. You create a black hole, uh, and uh, black hole operates with time proportional to an energy cube of the collision. And the cross section for the creating a black hole is grows with energy, and uh, it has M Planck there. So uh, the memory about M Planck never forgotten in gravity. So gravity very different from quantum field theory in that respect. There is a built-in energy scale there which stays all the way in the, in the UV and that's exactly what also happens in this theory. So optimistically 
I would like to think that th the reason this construction was possible exactly because these theories are very similar to gravity in that respect. So that would be an uh, optimistic uh, resolution. Of course, it could be that we're just confused and don't uh, think about hierarchy problem in the right way. But, uh, so to, to say it a little bit more precisely, let me now reformulate, let me run second iteration and <coughs> reformulate a hierarchy problem somewhat more carefully. And I would like to do it uh, directly in the proper terms of the properties of randomization group flow without ever mentioning quadratic divergences. Because quadratic divergences, well, it's a nice and fast way to see that there is a problem, but it's really, if, if it's a real physical problem, it shouldn't rely on the way we calculate things. And uh, quadratic divergences, whether they are not there or not, well, it's clearly, it uh, depends on how you calculate things. So for instance, you can do in dimensional regularization, and then another quadratic divergence there, of course, it doesn't mean that there is no hierarchy problem in dimensional regularization, but just it means that it's better to have, if it's a real problem, there, sh there should be a formulation which is uh, uh, somewhat uh, more invariant. Uh, and then for concreteness, let's place the whole discussion in the context of uh, non supersymmetric grand unified models. Uh, so I'm imagining there is a standard model, and then there is a GUT scale, much higher than electronic scale. Uh, and then at energies between the Higgs mass and God scale, physics can be approximately summarized like that. So there is a, a conformal invariant theory, which is standard model with all masses and couplings set to zero, uh, which is perturbed by a bunch of operators, relevant operators, and the most important one is the Higgs mass. And it's perturbed by a bunch of irrelevant operators, which are suppressed by this uh, high, high, high mass scale and God. And already at this point, one may wonder, well, why, how comes that this MH is so much smaller than M God? So isn't it a problem? Uh, well, but it's, well, it's really just, hierarchy problem is not, it's a problem of fine tuning. It's not just a problem that there are numbers of, uh, which are very different. So there are mosquitoes, there are elephants. So we don't say that just the presence of different numbers of nature. That's by itself, it's not a problem. But the problem is when, Kind of when you need to calculate the mass of uh, mosquito, if you need to subtract two elephants, that's that's what we call fine tuning problem. So that we don't see here yet. Uh, so so to see here, we need to do the following. So let's look at the whole picture from the point of view of energies uh, above this uh, high energy scale, above M God. Then you, what you find, you find another conformal field theory, which is SU five. Uh, gauge, gauge, gauge theory in this case, again, with all couplings and mass set to zero, which is suppressed by, which is uh, perturbed by two relevant operators. And the hierarchy problem is a problem of choosing somehow you need these two operators, one, at least two. One can be the electronic Higgs mass, another the uh, mass of the adjoint Higgs, which breaks SU5. There is no symmetry which distinguishes them. That's equivalent to saying there is no symmetry which protects Higgs mass. So you need to tune the coefficients with, with which you turn on these operators in a very accurate way such that you get a light Higgs mass. So I think it may be better summarized by a picture. So what I've shown here, so this is kind of space of theories. So this is this SU5 theory in the UV. So there are different ways you can start up G flow from this, from this UV fixed point. And if you start in a kind of gene generic direction, you end up immediately either, well, in the standard model, or as seen below the electronic scale with Higgs of, 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 of the mass Higgs, or Higgs mass of the gas scale, or with the Higgsless version of the standard model, where electronic symmetry is not broken, but Higgs again still has a mass of the gas scale. But instead, what the deformation which nature chose is very, very special in the sense that it's RG trajectory which spends a huge amount of RG time near well, standard model with CFT 3 to 1 from the previous slides, meaning standard model with massless Higgs, uh, and then it branches off to uh, what we see at low energies. So this is a pictorial way to say what hierarchy problem is, and, but I like it because it, it, it formulated in RG invariant terms. So I, I, I never had to mention uh, quadratic divergences to draw this picture. Uh, but the next interesting feature of our example is that there is no picture like that there. 
So uh, if I go at energies below, above uh, that one of L scale there, uh, theory doesn't become uh, doesn't become conformal. So in, in principle, I'm not able to draw a picture like that. So uh, and that suggests that again, the interesting lesson would be that 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 may be indication that gravity is somehow special as far as hierarchy problem goes. So let me just remind you. So this is a slide I showed last time. Uh, but so. Uh, and also it illustrates what, what the theory does at high energies. So, and also it illustrates why it's really analogy with gravity is not uh, totally ad hoc. So this, if I, if I took two free bosons and uh, apply this gravitational dressing procedure to them, I would get this phase shift. So I would get this matrix, which is described by E to the S. And this phase shift actually something that's familiar from another context. It's a phase shift which you get in high dimensional gravity if you scatter to uh, uh, just relativistic rocks at high energies, at transplankian energies, but very large impact parameter, such that all the scattering goes essentially at zero angle. Uh, so they're far enough, they don't produce the holes, they go forward, but there is a phase shift, and this, this phase shift given exactly, it's iconal phase shift, which is given exactly by the formula which I, I used in that gravitational dressing. And you see from this form of the phase shift that like you see here that the theory remembers about the scale because the larger the energy is, the larger the phase shift is there. Time delay, for instance, grows uh, grows with time indefinitely, and that's this phase shift is very different from anything what you find in quantum field theory. So this theory is not scale invariant in BBB. Uh, so that's one one way to see it, and that's also one way to see why why it's gravitational. Uh, so uh, let's take the optimistic conclusion. And possible lesson from this construction would be, well, maybe that, that example shows that we should be more serious about thinking on shell when gravity is involved. So in the way we phrase hierarchy problem and the way we usually construct uh, quantum field series, Lagrangian formulation and Wilsonian way of thinking about stuff is really built in from the very beginning. But on the other hand, we keep saying that gravitational theories, they're different, they don't have local observables, which is true, because if you try to do, physically, if you try to do local measurements with infinite precision, you produce a black hole, which will uh, collapse your lab, and your lab will collapse in, your, in the black hole, just because if you want to make precise clocks, which are small enough, they would be too heavy. Uh, so gravity is really different from that point of view. It doesn't have local observables, it has only well, the only mathematically well-defined point is there on-shell observables, and maybe so that would be interesting uh, lesson to draw from this example. So maybe we should take that that, that more seriously when we think about gravitational series. Uh, and for instance, as far as cosmological constant problem grow, goes, uh, so I think that's a very nice illustration that taking that point of view, uh, this potentially may lead to very different conclusions because really much of the most of the arguments like about anthropic solution of cosmological uh, constant problem, they start from saying, well, there is nothing special about zero vacuum energy uh, because well, if you manage to find that there is something special, that's how we to solving cosmological constant problem. Hence, we know distribution of vacuum around, around zero because we can tailor expand because the energies which we're interested in are so much smaller than Planck and there can be no singularity in the distribution of vacuum around zero because because otherwise you solve cosmological constant problems. However, the moment we start thinking on shell, well, of course, then the zero cosmological constant becomes extremely special. Because, well, if it's negative, we know what on shell quantities we talk about. The, uh, this is CFTs, uh, conformal field series, that was described here in, in ADS. Uh, if we go to flat space, this is scattering uh, elements S matrix, which is already a very different object from this one, and we go to positive cosmological constant, which is the world we live in, then we don't even know what are the right uh, on-shell observables. So uh, that's uh, of course one of the problems for, in, for the world we live in. We don't even know what are the uh, mathematically well-defined quantities to calculate uh, to describe its, its, its physics. Uh, so, but even at the very first step, you find com yourself in a completely different situation if you whether you think on-shell and, and uh, off shell, and uh, maybe that, that this is a lesson to draw uh, more generally about gravitational, gravitational series. Uh, so, well, to conclude, so let me 
But when I ask, okay, is there a place for this scenario within the standard picture I outlined for you in the beginning? Uh, oh, it's something really completely uh, uh, out of this world. Uh, so, so another way to phrase what I to, to say what I said at the beginning that well, in the landscape there are two canonical regions, the regions people usually talk about, which are capable of producing a light Higgs. One is a some big island where Higgs mass is protected by some symmetry, or because C Higgs mass is Higgs is one positive particle that would be technicolor realized. Uh, and another, there are 10 to 100 or so of random vacuum, and we happen to leave one of them with small Higgs mass because that's where we could live. So this is this geographic description of two standard approaches. But maybe there is something like a third one. So maybe, well, Dragon land here, but it's really it's something like you have a small, it should be a small set of strongly coupled vacuum such that there is a string coupling is really the one such that you have a uh, the only heavy scale which is there is Planck mass such that there are no, no normal quantum field theoretic thresholds, uh, and that's all what you have. Uh, and well, just the very fact that there is all this junk which is there in string theory doesn't mean that we don't live there. So maybe this vacuum somehow dynamically preferred. So if, if you like, that would be an example of like early dreams of string theories from, from 80s. That basically from first principles, like you can derive uh, all the uh, properties of the world, something like that. There are some very special uh, solutions of string theory, which, uh, and so in that sense, string theory becomes very predictive. I don't know, probably it's too optimistic to hope for that, but still I think this this construction uh, may, may be interpreted as something like that may not be impossible. And again, just the fact that these exist doesn't mean that we, we, we necessarily live there. So I, I think we, we shouldn't, because that, that's a usual attitude. So, oh, this dream is doomed because there is this landscape. But I don't think that's the necessary con conclusion, just that there is junk that doesn't mean that we have to live there. So, uh, and, well, more, more generally, uh, and that's, uh, I think, another possible le lesson coming from there, that maybe we just, just should think more, more carefully about uh, what naturalism is, and more generally think about how we construct quantum field series. Uh, well, because, well, I think we're all facing the situation, which is a very tough situation, but let's say, a year from now, after she starts running, but it may be that we'll see new natural physics and that we'll know what, what to do. But it, it well may be that we don't see anything and we, we, we should think, how, how do we proceed? And I think it's easier for theorists in some sense uh, because, well, then definitely we don't understand many things about quantum field theories and maybe the message will be that somehow we misread was what hierarchy our problem is telling us and we should just try to uh, to think harder about quantum field theories and ask, f look for different ways of building quantum field theories. Just, just, just uh, if some construction looks very unnatural in some way of uh, looking at it, doesn't mean that it's really unnatural. So this is kind of toy, a natural is problem for you. So if I give you this sequence of digits, is this sequence of digits natural or not? Because if you think about the sequence of digits, well, it looks like that. Uh, totally random, but then if you ask the right question, of course, you realize there is, there is a meaning to that. So uh, maybe there is a lesson like that. Uh, okay, thank you. Any questions? Right, In another talk a week or so ago, we heard some discussion of, of theories where there is a it is a quantum field theory, but it has no Lagrangian. Okay, uh, is that is that possible within string theory? That string theory necessarily is going to produce a Lagrangian, or uh, no, of course, yeah, because you know, just many two-dimensional conformal field series, which are like that. So saying there is no, no Lagrangian really means that, well, there is no useful description when series weakly coupled, right? So, 
And yeah, there are examples like that, but what I'm talking about here is something more, more dramatic than that. Because So this theory is actually one of the reasons to draw in this slide, because indeed people were suggesting, oh, maybe if strong standard model becomes strongly coupled in the UV, maybe that will solve, uh, get around the character problem. I think this picture demonstrates, no, that, that's, that's not the case. You, can, you will still, still have the same problem even if it's strongly coupled to your fixed point. So really, this example I'm talking about here, well, in some sense, theory doesn't have a Lagrangian in the UV, right? because it's really strongly coupled. At least I don't know, I'm not aware about Lagrangian description of this theory in the UV. But it's even more dramatic than that. It's also not conformal, there is no conformal fixed point in the UV. I'm curious, your example, the scalar theory, light scalar theory that's protected from large corrections in this framework, that's perturbative, right? Yeah, no, everything, yeah, so at low energy, everything. What I was good. wondering about is if you were to take that and couple the ground, there is this old lore about, you know, gravitational non-perturbative corrections and wormholes and whatnot. Yeah. Do, you have, do you get any insight? Well, into those, I mean, because they, well, it's not one, one answer. There are two answers to the question. But like the, the first one would be, I, I wrote for you the exact test matrix. In that sense, it's all non 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 perturbative. So everything but, is in principle included in there. That's right. Right. Everything right. is included. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, coming back to wormholes and stuff, I think there is something more potentially interesting question here. So, for instance, well, there was a paper by Joe Palchinski and Nima arguing that wormholes are physical because they build a construction where you have a DS-CFT pair, and on the DS side you have wormholes. On the other hand, there is completely conventional CFT dual, and so they say, okay, that means it's wormholes and physical settled points of, 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 of the theory. So, in, in part, this is exactly why I'm asking you, because they, they, they make that statement, but they don't really provide a clear answer. Yeah, but so, in, I think this, case, this example illustrates that that may be a bit too fast conclusion. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm talking about here, this series really is, should be sort of a theory on the whole sheet of a string. Now, that two-dimensional gravitational theory, and we know what wormholes are there. So, in, on, yes. so in, in string theory, considering two-dimensional gravity, wormholes worm hole describe like string scattering amplitudes, right? right? So they describe, mm -hmm. this wormhole describes the probability that you may split them too. So they're co completely physical. On the other hand, I just wrote for you the answer for this two-dimensional gravity, which doesn't know anything about these wormholes. But there is a new parameter here because, well, for this to be physical, <coughs> there's a new new constant which is here. So when I set G S equal to zero, then I'm uh, kind of in the situation which I'm telling for you. But there is another theory where G S is not equal to zero, where this whole form becomes becomes physical. So, and I think that's maybe one of the most interesting directions to go from here. That that tell, that maybe in some sense, like for instance, idea CFT is not the whole story. So maybe there are kind of extra parameters which you can turn on, other than this G string here, uh, which uh, may turn on this wormhole physics in, in the bound, similar to. Oh, well, in this example, we just know that's the case, so we, we, we can do it. So I think that argument was too fast, yeah, but... But in your particular example, what, what, what would be the... I mean, does it know about the wormholes and somehow just avoids those... I'm naively right no, about yeah, the old lore. The old lore is that you get... Your, your theory is not going to stay light or massless. It's going to get a huge mass correction from these... No, from but in my theory is just... I define the theory by the cis matrix. So I wrote for you exact formula of phase matrix, which is totally non-perturbative, satisfies everything. And yeah, so from, I think from the point of view of that theory, these wormholes, that's like Nima and Joe said, they're just unphysical settle points, so you should not include them. But there is another theory which includes them. And, uh, okay, Steve, one, one last question. So the, uh, Gravitational phase shift that you wrote down, that's from this old work on the icono approximation to gravitational scattering, right? So what prevents, what is it that keeps your theory from being at least an effective theory of gravity in more than two dimensions? I mean, I suppose one thing is that you don't have the possibility of black holes forming. No, but just the formula which I wrote for you, it was, it's very two-dimensional, so I don't know how to write it high dimensions. Well, actually, 
there was this form. The one way to think about this formula, there was this papers by Toft in late right. 80s, early 90s, where he wrote an ansatz for gravitational S matrix. Yeah. And for many reasons, that ansatz cannot be right in high dimensions. It doesn't describe black holes, and it doesn't have Hawking operation time scale in it. So, it, but if you take literally that formula and write it in two dimensions, that would be gravitational dressing formula which I wrote for you. Okay. And it happens to describe dynamics on the whole sheet of a string. I don't know but, but what is the deep reason for that. Yeah, but somehow we, we ran into that paper after we did it all. It was very amusing. So yeah, if you take literally Toft formula and run it, write it in two dimensions, then it would be exactly what, 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 what we're doing here. But in four dimensions, well, there are many reasons why that's not the right answer for, for gravity in two dimensions. And I don't know how to, how to do it in five dimensions. And let me announce that tomorrow from 1 to 2 in uh, 186 of the Grand Jam, we're going to have an open discussion with Sergey, so that will be another chance for people who want to ask questions. Let's thank Sergey again.